Where's my Bentley? Oh, he's had its day, I'm afraid. But it's never let me down. M's orders, 007. You'll be using this Aston Martin DB5 with modifications. And I suppose that's completely inconspicuous. Get in. Fittingly dubbed the most famous car in the world, James Bond's Aston Martin DB5 has made several appearances throughout the film series and is something of a signature staple of the 007 brand along with martinis, tuxedos and guns. I dare say the public probably know it more as the James Bond car than the actual model name. So if it is such a universally recognised hallmark of the series, why are some fans just sick of the sight of it? While obviously claiming that any recurring element of a film series is overused is subjective opinion more than anything else, I do find the discussion around the DB5 to be quite interesting because when you really lay it out, do they really use it all that much? The DB5 has so far appeared in eight Bond films, Goldfinger and Thunderball in 1960s, then appearing again in the 1990s in the Pierce Brosnan starring Goldeneye and Tomorrow Never Dies, before going on to feature in four of the five Daniel Craig Bond adventures. So that's eight films out of a total of 25, less than a third of the entire filmography. Let's look at these appearances in a little more detail though, starting with the car's debut in 1964's Gold Goldfinger, and probably the film where the car has its greatest exposure. It's Bond's signature gadget in the film, and it's given a lengthy briefing from Q around 23 minutes into the film. It goes on to be featured prominently as Bond investigates the villainous Goldfinger, using the various gadgets to further his inquiries, becomes involved in a car chase, and then around 50 minutes in, Bond crashes it into a wall, and it's out of the film for the rest of the running time. I guess Goldfinger just impounded it or something. Well, Bond or Q or someone must have had contacts with the impound lot as the spruced up vehicle returns in 1965's Thunderball, albeit for just a couple of very short sequences. First as his getaway vehicle in the pre-credits action, and then in a bait and switch scene in which the audience is prepped for a similar gadget laden car chase as the one we got in Goldfinger before Bond's would-be assailant is taken out by another character. In total, the DB5 scenes amount to just a couple of minutes in this film. You have to jump ahead 30 years before the car is used again, and now it is presumably Bond's own person vehicle. In 1995's Goldeneye, the car is used in a drag race with Xenia on top and appears in a few other Monaco-based shots, but overall this amounts to around five minutes worth of screen time. Even more fleeting though is its appearance in Tomorrow Never Dies, where it receives under a minute's worth of screen time, being used as Bond's personal vehicle. Now, it was to be used in this capacity again in 1999's The World's Not Enough, but was ultimately cut from the final version of the film, unless you count it potentially appearing on the MI6 heat vision at the end of the film, but this is literally a blink and you miss it appearance. Look, what's that? The car. So he must be nearby. Where? The car takes a break for 2002's Dine of the Day, but reappears in 2006's Casino Royale. Now, as a hard reboot of the series, the 007 of this timeline does not own an Aston Martin DB5 as given to him by Q in Goldfinger, so we see him win it at cards from the villainous Demetrios, providing us with a second origin story of how Bond received his beloved DB5. It's featured in some lovely shots, but again, screen time here amounts to no more than a couple of minutes. The car's most prominent role since Goldfinger appears in 2012's Skyfall. Fittingly, for the 50th anniversary of the series, the vehicle provides Bond and M untracked passage to Scotland, where the final action of the film takes place. It's also probably one of the most heartbreaking moments in the entire series, watching this absolute classic vehicle completely destroyed four hours in Bond's eyes. It's something of a final straw moment for Bond as well in terms of the story, and the fact that the DB5 is not just decoration, in this film, but it's actually woven into the story logically and contributes towards Bond's emotional journey, as well as tying into the film's themes of the past and the old ways and such, it gets my vote for the most meaningful reappearance of the car since Goldfinger, and given that it's completely obliterated, I remember thinking along with a lot of other fans in 2012 that this was going to be the last time we would ever see the DB5 in a Bond film. <laughs> Well, I was completely wrong, because Inspector, it turns out that Q has rebuilt the thing, and it appears on screen very briefly, first in a partially built state, and then completed at the end as Bond drives off into the sunset with Madeline Swan in the passenger seat. The car appears again in possibly its finest action role in No Time to Die. It's used in an elaborate action sequence and sports weapons hitherto unseen in the series, but it's very much just a part of the pre-title sequence, and aside from a little cameo in the opening titles, it isn't seen again, with Bond favouring his 80s Aston 
the latter parts of the film. So, going back to how the car has only appeared in eight of the 25 Bond films, I think this can be whittled down further by singling out the films in which the vehicle makes little more than just a cameo appearance, which I think gives us really just four films where the car has featured prominently. And in between all these appearances, he still had plenty of other vehicles, other models of Aston Martins, as well as other vehicle brands entirely, so where exactly is the sentiment that the DB5 is overused coming from? Is it not like complaining that James Bond wears a tuxedo too much, or he drinks too many martinis, or he says Bond James Bond too much? I mean, surely it's just part of the formula now, right? When fans complain that the car is overused in the film series, my inclination is to believe that it's not necessarily the films themselves where it's overused, but rather in the marketing and tie-in merchandise surrounding the films. Since The Thing was first featured in Goldfinger, it has been a huge focus of tie-in products and marketing. Models and replicas still continue to be manufactured in various forms to this day, ranging from kids' toys to collectibles to Lego sets and Playmobil. In many ways, it's a way to market James Bond to a younger demographic without having guns or killing involved. It's just a fun car and you press buttons and stuff happens. That extends into video games too, where a whole new generation of Bond fans got to experience playing with the DB5 in a whole other way. 007 Ray Agent Under Fire, Bloodstone, heck, they even fit the DB5 into the video game adaptation of From Russia With Love despite the car not even appearing in the film itself, the thing is so iconic. It's saying something when the car itself can just exude Bondian style without even having to have a dashing hero behind the wheel. This ad campaign for Bollinger really hit that home for me. I mean, take away the title of the film and the 007 logo and you're still left with something that just feels right out of the world of 007 and that's how synonymous that car is with the series. While there may have been a huge gap of 31 years between Goldfinger and Goldeneye, that didn't stop the car being synonymous with Bond for the sake of parody either. I mean, George Lazenby and Roger Moore both had DB5s to drive during their appearances in The Man from Uncle and The Cannonball Run, respectively, despite neither actor actually being behind the wheel of the car in their official Bond films. No, oh. not that one, darling. I'm afraid this car is full of surprises. I think very recently, too, there has been an abundance of DB5 related promotional material due to the fact that the car is featuring prominently in No Time to Die. The images of the Gatling guns have been in most trailers. Uh, when they were filming the sequence, there was an abundance of behind-the-scenes videos and shots, and so much so that maybe I was even a bit tired of seeing the thing in the build-up to that 25th Bond film. I'm sure a lot of Bond fans out there would be happy to give the thing a rest for 30 years, but I think that now the thing has become so ingrained in the Bond formula, it's kind of hard to imagine them proceeding without it in some capacity. I also think it's worth bearing in mind how much the car means to a general audience. Chances are, if you're watching this channel, you're also a Bond fanatic who has seen these things 12 hundred thousand times, but there are people out there who maybe see an individual Bond film just once or twice in their entire lifetimes, and I know it's a terribly sad thought, but true, and I think that to those people, to a general audience, the DB5 is just a part of the formula at this point, and they wouldn't feel overexposed to it because, hey, it's been six years since the last Bond film. How can you be overexposed to something you literally just see a couple of times a decade. The Thing is obviously the most famous car in the world for a reason, and particularly thinking back to its first appearances, Goldfinger specifically, and seeing all the gadgets used and how beautiful the car looks, does it not awaken the grown-up child in all of us? I mean, it is the ultimate fantasy toy, surely. Personally speaking, while I do like the variety of seeing Bond behind the wheel of different cars, there is just something about the Aston Martin DB5 that is so magical and just such a, such a huge part of this cinematic universe that I just always delight every single time I see it on screen and I think it's really interesting that even all this time after it was first introduced into the series, something like No Time to Die can come along and use the car in new, fresh, exciting and interesting ways while still remaining true to the fun spirit in which the car was first introduced all those years ago. I can't imagine it'll be wrested from the film series entirely, even though it might take some time for it to be reintroduced with whatever the next incarnation of Bond brings, but I wouldn't count on it disappearing from any kind of Bond marketing material anytime soon. Please do let me know your thoughts on this subject in the comments section below, and particularly about whether or not you feel like the DB5 is actually used a bit too much in the film series. Is more than two appearances of any vehicle in the Bond series overusing it? Please do let me know below.
below. Also below, you can click the subscribe button to subscribe to this channel if you've enjoyed this video and want to stay up to date on future video uploads. There's also the notification button, the Mrs. Bell button, if you want to stay really up to date on those things. And uh, also below are links to my various social media pages. So there's my Twitter page, my Facebook page, and my Patreon page. So please do use those links to check out those sites. And with all that being said, and until next time, Bond fans, so long for now.